So a lot of these passion talks um, are kind of looking at the question of like how is God at work in our field of studies. Uh, in my case, that would be mathematics. But I think that we kind of, in the case of mathematics, we have to back up and ask a more basic question of is God at work in mathematics? Or does it even make sense that God can influence mathematics or have any say in the matter? So the plan for my talk is to first explain an argument for why one might think that mathematics should be independent of God or that he should have no say in how mathematics turns out. Then I will discuss why I'm not happy with this or why I think this is a problem. Um, and then I'll try to actually solve the problem using ideas from mathematical logic. Um, I should add a disclaimer that I've, I've not really studied philosophy or theology. I'll probably drift into those topics in this talk, so take whatever I'm saying with a grain of salt. So one way that we Christians often model God's omnipotence is um, by viewing him as something like a fantasy writer who's able to make a completely arbitrary world. Like he can make the laws of physics be whatever he wants. He can make animals turn out however he wants. Um, so like God could make a world in which um, the earth had two moons or there was no gravity or cats have six legs. He could do really crazy stuff like um, make it be the case that some fundamental law of nature says that all lemurs teleport magically to Madagascar on Thursdays. Um, I mean, so the point here is just that um, it seems like in matters of like physics and biology and astronomy, God has a choice in how things turned out. Um, so I think it makes sense to say that he designed them because he was able to choose the laws of physics. He was able to choose how um, animals evolved or were created. Um, now, usually we put one kind of constraint on God with this model. Like, I think that we, we usually say he has to operate within the constraints of logic. Like he can make a completely arbitrary world, but it has to be logically consistent. Um, so for example, God can create a world in which all elephants are gray, like in our world. But then if he does that, there can't at the same time be purple elephants. Um, he can make the earth move in a square around the sun. But if he does that, then it's not going to be moving in an ellipse around the sun. Um, he can make magical teleporting lemurs. But this will put some kind of logical constraints on what happens. Like, you can't have a lemur that stays in Paris for two weeks if they all go to Madagascar every Thursday. So this kind of like logical implication, this, this, these don't seem that, these seem kind of trivial and harmless. And it doesn't seem like it should cause us any kind of theological problems or anything to worry about. Um, but now what about this kind of statement? God can create like quantum electrodynamics, but then he has to create thermodynamics and chemistry. So like, why have I said this? Um, like, so my understanding of chemistry is a little sketchy, but if I, if I understand correctly, I think that you can, like chemistry and thermo can kind of be derived from physics. Um, and somehow like, once you fix the laws of physics, these other things are kind of determined. And we can't imagine a world where like the laws of physics are the same as in ours, but something like TNT behaves differently. Um, because its behavior is determined by physics. Um, so then the question is, does, did God have any freedom in designing chemistry? Like, um, like, he could certainly choose the laws of physics to be whatever he wanted, but once he does that, it seems like all of chemistry just kind of appears on its own. So um, in mathematics, we have the same problem, but it's a lot worse. So let me discuss something called the Mandelbrot set, which seems unrelated, but Anyhow, this is um, the Mandelbrot set. It was discovered by somebody named Mandelbrot. Um, it's the black area in this picture. The outside is, the color is a little bit weird, but anyhow, this is a weird looking shape. It's defined by a really simple rule, actually, about as complicated as a rule that defines like a circle or a square. But you'll notice this is a lot more complicated than those shapes. Um, like around the boundary, you have kind of infinite amounts of detail. And it turns out as you zoom in, there's a lot of interesting features that you have all over the place. Like there's this area here called the Seahorse Valley where you get these repeating spiral patterns. Um, there's these mini brats that occur all over the place, which are just little miniature copies of the whole thing. Um, and they occur in lots of different styles, basically all over the boundary of the set. Um, sorry if the pictures are a little washed out. Um, you have these kind of logarithmic spiral things called Misurevich points. Um, so you get all these different features in the Mandelbrot set. Um, but these features are kind of, they're, they're logical consequences of the rule that defines the set. And there's sort of a sense in which we can't imagine a world where the Mandelbrot set looked any different. Like, um, it would be like imagining a world where squares are defined the same way but don't have corners. Um, it's somehow an intrinsic part of the set that you get these features. Um, so I think that in the same way that you might say something like this, that. God is sort of forced to create chemistry and thermo. Um, 
maybe he's also kind of forced to add all these features to the Mandelbrot set. That no matter what God does, the Mandelbrot set has to have these like these mini brats and Misurevich points. Um, so this should be kind of troubling, I think. Like, because can we really say that God designed the Mandelbrot set if he had no say in the matter? Um, so this kind of problem just occurs throughout pure mathematics. Um, the reason why is that pure mathematics is essentially the study of exactly the things which are logically necessary, um, or the things that we can prove, um, or equivalently, like the things which sort of can't vary from possible world to possible world. Um, so if, if we think of that, that, that's what pure mathematics is, it's sort of not clear, like, it seems like that's exactly the things that should be independent of God, or that, that God can't have any say in. Um, so does this matter? Like, maybe mathematics is independent of God. Is that really a problem for us? Well, I would think so. Because if we're gonna say that God didn't create mathematics, where you have a lot of this structure and interesting stuff that's going on, then like, what else do you maybe not create? Um, something over that. Um, I mean, I think that you can run the same kind of arguments for things like chemistry or for like strategy and board games. Because in both those cases, you have some really complicated thing, which is interesting and structured, but which kind of emerges from simple rules. Um, Maybe you could also put like wisdom on this list. Like, it's sort of not clear. It's hard to think about how how God could have created wisdom. Um, like the author of the book of Proverbs seems to think that it's possible. You have that um, personified wisdom kind of gives a speech where she says like the Lord brought me forth as the first of His works before His deeds of old. But it's kind of hard to think about like how how could God create wisdom? It's sort of a lot of wisdom seems to be kind of self evident. Um, Another reason why I care about this is, I mean, as a Christian uh, mathematics graduate student, I'd like to know whether the stuff that I'm studying is created by God and whether I can glorify God by studying this. Um, I actually got in an email discussion with one of my friends several years ago who was in mathematics or studying it at the time, um, and he had the same kind of concern. So he wrote, um, people tell me that only those things have any worth which are God's work, but pure mathematics does not aim to do God's work. It is accumulation of knowledge for the sole sake of accumulation of knowledge based on 20 axioms. As a result, mathematics is a study of another world, a world without God. How can this be God's work? Doesn't this constitute heresy or idolatry? So this, this idea, or this sentiment, like, is understandable to me. Um, and it's something that I also kind of worry about. Um, also, I would like to know whether I can pray about my research. Um, like, if I'm, if I'm working on a problem and I'm trying to prove something, can I pray th that this will be true? Because what if it's, if it's not true, if I can prove that it's false, then it's sort of logically impossible, and there's no way it could have been different, right? So how can God answer that kind of prayer? So I'm actually going to just argue that in spite of everything I've just said, that God actually can influence mathematics. And um, I'll try to describe, or sort of describe a specific way that that can happen, I think. Um, so I'll first um, kind of summarize what the, like the crux of the issue is so far. The problem is that some, so some statements, like, there are, there are purple elephants. They might be true in some worlds and false in others, um, and they're not kind of logically, they're not absolute. They can be true in some worlds and false in others, and when we say that there are no purple elephants, we're sort of making a statement about our specific world. Um, but if we say something like, it is necessary that there are purple elephants, that's now a statement about all possible worlds. And since it's no longer a statement about any specific world, this new kind of statement, the thing that's in quotes there, whether or not that's true should not vary from world to world. If, if things were being reasonable, um, or you would think. But it, um, logic kind of does whatever it wants, though. So somehow it can vary from world to world, apparently, because logic is weird. So um, let me discuss like how logical necessity has to do with um, provability. So there's a theorem called Godel's completeness theorem, um, not to be confused with this incompleteness theorem, which was related to the stuff Elliot was talking about. Um, so this theorem basically says that if you have a statement, you can kind of, it's logically necessary if and only if it can be proven from the laws of logic, which are some laws that people have written down. Um, so if you have something which can't be proven, then you can imagine a world where it's actually false. But the short version is that sort of being logically necessary is the same thing as being kind of provable from the laws of logic. So if the issue is whether or not logic is kind of absolute, then what, we're, what we wonder about is, is provability kind of absolute? Like, can I imagine a world where different things are provable just from the same basic laws of logic that we have? 
And um, it turns out that you can imagine a world where different things are provable, which is kind of weird. So um, more specifically, it turns out in a sense which I could make precise, but I'm not going to because um, it would involve set theory. So we can imagine a world in some sense of the word in which this happens. So what the heck is this? Um, so ZFC is the axioms of set theory. It's basically the, the de facto axioms of mathematics. And um, no inaccessible cardinals is some statement about transfinite arithmetic or infinite numbers. Um, OK, why do we care? Well, the weird thing is that in our world, um, as far as we know, ZFC does not prove the statement. So just to clarify, in our world, you can't. This, there's some statement that there's no inaccessible cardinals. We can't prove it from the axioms of math. Um, but we can imagine a world where you can prove that. So in that other world, you have a mathematician, like a mathematician could write down a proof that, of this statement, whatever it is. And there, he's using the same axioms of math and the same laws of logic as us, which is a bit counterintuitive or kind of paradoxical. Because um, he's sort of playing like a game with the same rules that we're playing, and yet he's still able to do new things. So that seems like it shouldn't be possible. Um, it is, though. And without going into too many details, roughly what happens is that the proof that this guy writes down um, would look like it's infinitely long to us. Um, and it would contain some kind of gaps in the middle that the mathematician of the other world wouldn't be able to spot. Um, but at any rate, like from, from the point of view of that other world, they could not even really imagine our world. Because it would be like, it would seem like our world is logically contradictory, or that there's things about it which are just false, and provably false. Um, it'd be like trying to imagine a world where you can start counting like one, two, three, four, and keep going forever and never get to 12. Um, like we can't imagine that kind of world. And it's actually exactly the same problem that they would have trying to imagine our world. So um, in this hypothetical world, you have this new statement that you can prove. And it's actually, there's really no way that the people in that world could tell it apart from a fundamental law of logic, like um, whatever that one's called, modus ponens or something. Um, so there's a sense in which we've just imagined a world where there's new fundamental laws of logic. Um, so it seems like if you're like a fantasy author or somebody imagining new worlds, even if you can't remove from the laws of logic, like you can't imagine a world where basic laws of logic stop working, you can imagine a world where there's new laws of logic in effect. Um, so I, I think that God could presumably have done the same thing when he created our world. Um, that would mean some interesting things. It would mean that things that maybe seem like basic laws of logic to us are actually just put in place by God. Um, like, who knows, maybe all of logic was put in place by God. There's actually not really any way you could test this. I mean, the thing I'm, this theory or whatever that I'm describing makes no predictions at, at all. So that's kind of weird. And there's not really any reason to believe it. Um, but I, I guess I'm a mathematician, so I don't care about what's likely or what's probable. I care about what's like possible. Um, and so as long as I know of at least one way in which like God could have created mathematics, I'm willing to agree that, that God could have created mathematics. And then for separate reasons that have to do with like um, the Bible and special revelation, I'm going to actually conclude that he did create mathematics. So if that's the case, then what does that mean? Well, for me, it means I can, I can pray about problems I'm working on in research. Um, I think it means I can glorify God by doing mathematics. Um, because that means that when I'm doing mathematics, I'm, I'm learning about God's creative work from the beginning of the world and I'm telling people about it. Um, and I think it also says something interesting about the kind of miracles that we have in mathematics. So there's a lot of places in math where things, really surprising things happen or fields that shouldn't be connected turn out to be secretly connected or people try, somebody tries something and it just works out fantastically well. Um, and of course, all of these cases, you can sort of prove that this has to happen and there's something sort of, oh, it's logically inevitable, so it's not really a miracle. But even so, it's still really surprising. Um, and if we're willing to say that God created mathematics and that mathematics is a little arbitrary, then um, the, these, all these miracles could actually just be literally miracles. Um, in fact, going along on that line, I think that it's kind of astonishing that mathematics works at all. I mean, if you think about it, if, if you didn't know anything about mathematics and somebody shows up and says, oh, we've found this game that we can play with symbols, um, and somehow it just magically produces true, sta true statements about the world that make testable predictions that we can verify, and, um, and it never says anything false. Then you'd be like, well, that's kind of weird. Like, how does that happen? Um, so I think it's, it's sort of astonishing that mathematics proves anything useful or anything interesting, and also that it doesn't like, 
it's not broken. It doesn't prove contradictory nonsense. Um, so I think that the fact that if we're willing to say that God created mathematics, the fact that it isn't broken and that we can use it to do interesting things maybe tells us something about God's nature, like that he values um, reason and logic. Um, that's, I think, all I've got time for. So questions?